Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Legal Transformation Webinar presented by Economic Times India Leadership Council. The theme of today's discussion is Trust, Transparency, and Transformation, General Council Leadership in the Modern Age of Disruption and Uncertainty. The session is powered by iSOTIS in association with Microsoft. I'm Shambhavi Jha from ETILC, welcoming you all to the webinar. To talk a bit about the topic of discussion today, the role of general counsel has evolved significantly over the past decades, from a pure legal risk management function to a strategic advisor to the CEO and board leadership. This cadence of constant transformation has only accelerated in this new decade, are driven by the need to bring in revenue cycles, the uncertainty of a global pandemic, risk of cybersecurity attacks, ever-changing regulatory landscape, and threat of reputational damage. Uh, in response, general councils are rethinking their leadership roles and extending their influence by introducing innovative technology tools and cultivating new talent and skills for their legal departments to thrive in this age of disruption and uncertainty. And this legal transformation webinar today will commence with leadership insights on the positioning of legal department and its importance in India, with focus on strengthening trust and transparency, two pillars that are critical for all business relationships especially in the face of privacy and cybersecurity. Our esteemed keynote speakers, I'll be introducing them shortly, uh, they will share their thoughts on how they're undertaking their own digital and skill transformation with each legal professional embracing these changes with tech intensity as the key of their organization's success around the globe. Later in the session, we have a power-packed panel with us that will delve into the critical importance of general counsel leadership in time of significant disruption and evolution of legal department. Today's general counsels require more than just legal and technical pedigree. The need is a host of dynamic leadership skills to lead the legal department and business through disruption, ambiguity, and transformation. Uh, we'll now we'll go on to the opening keynote uh, conversation, exploring the theme of trust, transparency, and transformation. I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speakers, Ms. Bernadette Bullockin, Vice President and Lead Global Evangelist, ISOTIS, and Mr. Kesha Dhakar, Group Head and General Counsel, Corporate External and Legal Affairs, Microsoft India. Without any further delay, I would now request Bernadette to take it from here. Over to you, Bernadette. Audio cut, holding slide activated. Bernard Ma'am, stand by. On my count of three, we'll go live. Three, two, one, zero. We are live. Go. Well, good morning, everyone. And what a pleasure and delight it is to join all of you this morning. And what a way to kick off the weekend to have uh, Keshav in this panel that we were going to meet shortly, being able to learn from them uh, be guided by their insights. I am just so thrilled to partner with the Economic Times in this very esteemed panel. And what a strange and very exciting time we are living in from the pandemic to the supply chain disruption that we're seeing, uh, from expectations that are changing from our consumers. There's no doubt that this is a time of great and hyper change. And these forces, are extremely affecting the way legal departments, the type of work they are doing, how they do that work, the people that are coming into the departments. It is changing how legal departments function today and into the future. And it's why I'm so thrilled to start our conversation with Keshav. Keshav, I know that you are so focused right now on those three T's and it's just been such a pleasure to pick your brain in preparation for this conversation to talk about trust, transparency, and transformation. So let's kick it off first. First, can you tell us a little bit about your legal department and your role before we dive into those T's? Thank you, Bernadette. And good morning to all who've joined us. And of course, my fellow panelists, uh, it would be a great session uh, considering what you know, the transformation we are talking about in the general counsel's role. So, uh, Bernadette, yes, uh, I'm the general counsel of Microsoft India, and uh, uh, my role is, is, is about Microsoft managing and supporting all the businesses in Microsoft India. But I think my department uh, is, is a very unique department because of the multifaceted nature of uh, support and, and enablement that, that we do. 
uh, and it is called Corporate External and Legal Affairs. It's a long name, uh, uh, but I think it signifies the diversity uh, of, this, of the talent that we have, but also the skill sets uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the businesses that we kind of support uh, across engineering, sales, marketing, R&D, uh, services, and, and so on and so forth. So it has the elements of uh, uh, corporate and, and, uh, you know, and legal and product development support, which also includes engineering support. Uh, we have government affairs and public policy. Uh, we have compliance teams, uh, as well as uh, the teams which look into investigations for compliance violations. Uh, then we have digital crimes unit, uh, as well as philanthropy. So if you can see the, just the diversity of the uh, teams which are within one team, uh, which is CELA, CELA, uh, gives us a very different and a diverse perspective of, of our support and our, how our roles are evolving. So look forward to our conversation. Yes. Well, I think that diversity of practices and teams will come into play in our conversation, absolutely. So as I mentioned, as we were thinking about the transformation of the legal department, which means transformation of those leaders like Keshav and leading these diverse teams, I wanna take this opportunity now to focus on that first T and that is trust. So I am sure Keshav that trust can mean so many things to you from your particular seat. It could be the trust that your teams are building with their stakeholders of, of so se several stakeholders that you have. That T could be about the contractual relationships that you are helping your business secure and perform under and deliver. That T could talk about that trust in cybersecurity and privacy that you owe to your end users and to your consumers. So with that, Tell me a little bit about that T. What does trust mean to you and your legal department? And how are you seeing that expressed within your department and the legal services it's delivering? Uh, absolutely, Bernadette. Um, you know, as I think about it, uh, trust is a currency which, which kind of take long time to build, but short time to break. Uh, and and I think it is it is also uh, about really what you practice, what you preach. Uh, so trust is a very widely used term, but I think when we go into the depth of what truly trust mean uh, to everybody, uh, I, I think you will see very different perspectives. There's a strong practice maybe I want to mention, which we have in Microsoft uh, called Microsoft Runs on Trust. Uh, uh, and it is it is and it is about uh, you know policies, practices, and principles, uh, which is core to everything we do in, in any part of our business anywhere in the world. Uh, it's so much so that Satya uh, once mentioned in, in a global forum that we are a platform of trust, uh, not on Azure or Office or Windows, etc. And I think that was very profound the way uh, he looked at trust. Uh, that uh, uh, you know, we, we you know people will not adopt technology unless they trust it, right? So I have you know you know four or five areas in which I believe trust kind of uh, should be measured, uh, you know, in different uh, dimensions. One is of course trust in business practices, uh, and that is about you know how does senior management operate their business, run their business, right? What kind of compliance norms that they follow, what kind of do's and don'ts that they have clarity on, uh, uh, do they have full visibility to the policies that govern their practices. Uh, and we, we even incite, uh, you know, trust is not something that is the domain of only my team or the, uh, or the finance compliance team or HR. Uh, we have business led compliance rhythms, right? Where business is the owner. Our uh, corporate vice president in India is the chief uh, ethics officer. Uh, of the company, it is not me or, or the CFO. Uh, then it comes to the whole customer uh, practices, how we engage partners and how we even uh, engage with community services, uh, right, that we undertake. So, because this is a multiplying in the digital age, pandemic has taught a lot to us and the role is really evolving of, of uh, uh, general counsels and the teams uh, you know, under the department. And I think it's very important to keep focus on the business practices remain central to uh, uh, you know, developing trust. Then trust is in the commercial contracts, uh, if we come to it, right? Because it's all, when you, it's all about commercial relationships with customers, 
in different shape and form. And where security is playing a critical role or the data privacy, even how data is handled, uh, whether it's PII or non-PII, is critical about uh, is critical in, in establishing trust, the intellectual property, the open source, uh, liability areas, or, or even confidentiality. It's very important to have contracts which establish trust as compared to uh, you know uh, uh, dilute trust or break trust. Then trust in people. I think it is about uh, we work with each other, and that's critical to ultimately people make companies, uh, right? And and the culture of it is very critical. The working relationships that we have with each other, we trust each other, the empathy. Uh, and I would absolutely would want to emphasize the importance of diversity and inclusion in the way you operate, right? Do you have a speak up culture? Does everyone has a voice? Uh, and are you, are you, you know, promoting individual champions versus are you really promoting teamwork and team champions? Uh, because it is about collaboration. No one person can solve for it. Uh, and last two would be trust in technology. And, and I think this is, this is about the accountability that any provider of service, and I, of course, I'm looking at tech uh, as the center here, uh, is that you need to accept uh, uh, you know, accountability for technology, uh, the way that technology serves people, uh, the, the consumers uh, or, or your customers in, in different ways. And I think we've taken a very high ground. We were the first company to come out with responsible AI principles. Uh, our uh, global leader, Brad Smith, even wrote a book, Tools, and weapons, where he mentioned that while you develop technology, which can be very productive tools, but if, if not used properly or not developed with, with responsibility, then it can even become a weapon. And last, let me end with uh, trust with government and regulators, uh, including communities that we serve. Very, very critical uh, that we have the, the private sector and the government and the communities have to work hand in hand. Uh, and I think uh, the, the, the GCs, the partners play a very critical role in enabling that uh, le level of communication, that level of trusted engagements, but also how do you really learn from them and how do you really be on a service mode as compared to just telling them what, what uh, uh, and how. So uh, I think that that's what probably, you know, the trust is still a big, big, uh, uh, you know, uh, a topic to discuss, but these, these are my thoughts that, uh, on trust and, and the criticality of the same. I appreciate, and it's so clear, just how much that is part of the DNA of the way that you work, because it is so well thought out. It is so comprehensive. Um, and I wish, I wish there was more time to, to double click on each of those elements. Um, but we, unfortunately, we have to go on to another T and they are so connected. Um, if you live in pools of trust, whether it's your commercial relationships with your um, your business practices and technology, all of those elements you've described. Um, with that trust, you have to operate with also a level of transparency. And I do believe that in this arena, that transparency is playing a new and dominant role. And, you know, just as you've described, that could be transparency about your use of AI, um, the security of the cloud. Um, that transparency might come into play as it applies to um, ESG. Who are you working with? What are your business practices? Are you a sustainable business in adopting those practices? So tell me a little bit um, about how transparency uh, guides your practices and your business. No, thanks, Bernadette. I think transparency, the T of transparency is one of the core elements of trust. Uh, and and it, is, it is one of the most talked about concept in the digital age. Uh, today, as we see around, if you really go carefully observe uh, as to the discussion around tech and how, it's, how it is impacting people and, and the opportunity that we have to, to uh, solve for all the problems of the world, uh, leveraging the power of the tech, uh, the transparency is key. And I think when you think of as simple as, you know, between a service provider and the consumer of those services and the regulators, does it have enough, do we, do we bring enough transparency uh, so we can work harmoniously and we have, we have less friction and, and conflicts and we can look forward in the same direction. So transparency is one of the core pillars of trust, as I said, 
And I think, you know, uh, uh, and, and so one is the external side of transparency, but I think let me just bring a bit of a, uh, the way in which my department and its workings uh, demonstrate uh, or practice transparency. So it's a journey for all of us. I think first thing, it starts with, uh, you know, when you, especially when you work in large organization with multiple departments sitting across different time zones, you know, uh, what steps are you taking to break silos within the department? Uh, right, and silos has been, I think silos still exist in, co in corporations and organizations. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of, lot of tech has actually, I would say, you know, uh, breaking those barriers has been enabled through tech. And if you, if, if I share with you, I think uh, today inside a SILA global, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, ecosystem, we have sales, engineering and marketing under one leader which I think is phenomenal to, to uh, you know, see how the collaboration across very different groups are working uh, in, a, in a seamless way. And, and there is a lot of sharing and there's a lot of collaboration happening. So teams are coming closer. Uh, teams are also a lot more sharing with each other. Also, they're developing practices which cuts across departments. Uh, then I think uh, when it comes to transparency, I think, uh, you know, we all know how complex contracts or commercial terms can be, or just the terms of use, uh, you know, for various services. And I think we have been on a journey for, for uh, many years to, from the bulky contracts and very, very lengthy detailed contracts, how do you really bring shorter templates? Uh, how do you just kind of get rid of the ones which probably more, you know, kind of, I would say, create more complexity in a relationship uh, as compared to building trust, right? And, and how do you bring more less complex terms? And we've done a great job from having maybe, you know, uh, more than 20 pages of contract to under less than 10 pages. So that is something important, but also I just want to say, how do you simplify a complex term, which is well understood by the contracting party on the other side, their lawyers, including the engineers. Sometimes even the R&D people are involved in interpreting what those terms mean and what implications can have. Uh, to our sales people. So it's not just, you just can't limit yourself in saying, as a legal expert, I can interpret this contract very well. I can understand each word, but you have to simplify as to the people it is serving. They can understand it well. And you bring that transparency as to what you want to achieve out of a particular clause or a contract. Then I think the transparency, as I mentioned, is related to silos. It's about, you know, do we have cross group learnings? capability development there? Do you have V teams which cut across different business groups? Uh, what we call it one Microsoft approach is one of our culture elements as that do we act as one Microsoft, right? Which means all different departments who serve different business groups have different reporting lines. Uh, are you able to come together to share across the business groups? I would say knowledge management is another area. Uh, which is core to transparency uh, and how you support the businesses, right? You can't be a resource for everybody all the time, but that's just not possible. And, and, and how do you manage your contracts, the, the, the legacy uh, and, and the future contracts, the new ways in which you are uh, developing best for customized contracts, all are very, very relevant uh, for, you, for, for you to really bring that level of uh, uh, transparency in terms of how the journey has been and where is Microsoft moving. So when you explain a decision, when you explain uh, a challenge to, to a business, uh, you know, your business clients or to a customer, they're able to really fully appreciate where you're coming from. And I, and I want to congratulate, I mean, we have been partners with iSertis for, for decades and, and you have really helped us mature our ability to do global contract management. Where we, today we are using AI analytics on the contracts to really learn how certain agreements and relationships have shaped up over the years and, and what do we learn from them to, to bring better decision-making, uh, better negotiations, having a better planning framework so we don't lose time and we can leverage the, the knowledge. And of course, how do you bring clear communications, both when you engage externally with your customers, partners, but also internally uh, with your colleagues and your business clients. Uh, that is music to my ears uh, about transparency and contractual processes and in those relationships. Uh, we have seen a change um, in transparency with simplification. And I think that is a trend that we are seeing across um, and especially in transparency and language. Too often we are writing contracts as lawyers for other lawyers and how empowering it is to be transparent to our stakeholders uh, so that they too can be empowered by that because it is simple, it is clear 
they are trained and we have that knowledge management. I think that those are all such keys to uh, transparent and trust um, in, those, in those relationships, both with the people that we are delivering legal services to within our business and to, to our end users. So that is, that is so fantastic. Um, what about transparency mandates um, related to supply chain? Is that something that you're seeing at Microsoft right now? Uh, no, absolutely. I think, um, you know, uh, transparency is cutting across our all services, supply chain, cloud services, and, and also, you know, at what each stage in which contractors, our employees, as well as vendors uh, and, and customers engage, you know, uh, what, what, uh, how transparent is that relationship, right? And let me just kind of, you know, uh, reflect on on, on uh, maybe particularly on the cloud contracts, right? I mean, we run 200 plus data centers serving 195 countries. So that's a very heavy lift uh, and a responsibility do we have. So, so, the, so the, uh, the number of engagements that we would have across our uh, supply chain at, at different parts of the world uh, require uh, you know, very clear terms of contract. Uh, and also the transparency goes all the way to the customers to, to say that, okay, uh, you know, this is how your data is going to be managed. This is how your privacy uh, would be would be you know um, uh, you know by design would be empowered uh, to you. And this is how cyber security norms would be applicable. Or if there's a data breach, this is how the this is how transparently we will work with you to share and and kind of take the mitigation steps, but also be very very uh, open about uh, you know how the whole process will work, uh, right? And I think that that includes uh, the whole subcontracting. So uh, the, the, the clauses or the relationship that we have with our customers have the equal bearing on the, the chain of, of subcontracting that, that we do. Uh, so they are not two different set of kind of, you know, uh, uh, levels of commitments uh, so that the, the commitment to customers flow all the way to the, the, the last person in the line uh, or, or the, who's working you know, on, 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 the, on the, you know, the engineering or the nitty gritties of, yeah. of, of uh, data or the technology. So no, absolutely, I think uh, supply chain security, supply chain, privacy in the supply chain, the integrity of the supply chain, these are very critical elements. And I think as GCs, we need to be really, you know, have a very good, uh, I would say, you know, uh, a clarity and also a good handle on how are these relationships getting shaped and what are the common theme that is flowing across. So everyone is equally accountable and they play their own unique role in, 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 in managing that supply chain and managing those, those contractual relationships. Thanks for that, Keshav. I wanted to go to our last T. And that last T again is a big umbrella. It's, it's the T of transformation. Um, that transformation could be based on tools and technology that, um, that you are using within your legal department. Um, that T could be transformation of your own soft skills or new, new skills that the business is asking you to create. You touched a little bit on, on training and technology. I'm curious about, and that was kind of externally, the technology that you are providing out to, um, out to the world and the software and services that you're providing out into the universe. What about technology within your own legal department? And, you know, I always talk about the stereotype about the tech adverse lawyer. Surely, surely here you are, uh, uh, the legal team here at Microsoft. Surely you are not a tech adverse <laughs> lawyer. Can you tell me a little bit about how technology has been transforming your team? For sure, Bernadette, I think, Transformation is, is, is a word, I think, which is upon us for a long time. Uh, uh, and I think it is accelerating more than ever in the last two years. And I think pandemic has a huge role to play in that. I think I, think I would like to probably start with, uh, you know, it starts with the culture. It starts with mindset, right? And, and it is not something which can be just given you on a template and saying, hey, go do these 10 things and you're transformed. Uh, because it, it is when it, when, when it is a part of the culture, then I think it goes into the, the uh, you know, I would say a 360 degree view of what your roles are, what your responsibilities are, how, is you, how are you developing the team and how are you really 
a kind of the, you know be a force to your organization and 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 enable it to grow and enable it to to serve the needs of the future and i think uh, we have been on a journey as a company for many years now especially under sapta nadella was that uh, we have to move away from the culture of know it all uh, to learn it all mm-hmm. uh, and, and that was the very foundational way in which he said you can never be know it all person or or a company because you can't know it all uh, it's just just impossible and if you ever pretend to be know it all then then uh, you're not being true to yourself that that uh, you know uh, you can't learn everything you can't know everything so i think that learn it all is that constant endeavor and constant uh, you know i would say zeal to say am i learning every day have i learned something new it is and also it is about keeping pace with your own tech uh, right and sometimes we all feel that we you know our tech is moving much faster our services our products are are far getting more complicated and advanced and and very sophisticated uh, 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 and i think we are trying to really learn uh, that pace of our tech change uh, second is also about you know uh, are you keeping uh, are you really you know kind of in the pace with external environment how it's evolving uh, both in the way in which uh, the markets are evolving the the global regulations local regulations are evolving uh, the way in which uh, you know uh the governments are thinking about leveraging tech it's about customers journey uh, of various industry solutions that they're looking for as compared to very uh you know in the box kind of uh, uh solution i think it is important that uh you start your transformation journey by having a learning mindset and a be a learning for life and and i mean if i, I should mention that it's okay for if you're you know a, a gc or if you are a, a you know part of the team to feel stupid or clueless in some meetings uh because you just can't be on top of everything that is being discussed and 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 that should allow you to say hey i didn't i didn't understand what's what just happened here and so you be curious uh you you ask questions to understand it and don't be shy about it uh, but also take trainings i think that the amount of skilling and upskilling that is uh, already underway you know across all you know corporations in and governments i think it's very important to continue to train yourself and and, and sometimes they are very good customized training to you to fully understand what uh, you know what you need to learn from so you can you know better serve and i think this goes to uh, again a, a kind of a you know a, an equation which satya came up with called tech intensity how do you really measure the growth of your transformation digital transformation as such and he used the word uh, the, the equation of uh it is any organization can measure and i said any department can also measure uh their tech intensity by assessing the uh the the tech adoption trends that you have inside your uh, teams or an organization versus are you building tech capabilities to be able to deploy and use those tech uh, applications and tools but that comes with the power of trust are you creating trust with those tech uh uh applications and and capabilities as compared to creating more roadblocks or having productivity issues if people don't trust that tech and i think adopt for our, our journey has been on you you mentioned that it comes it should come naturally for for someone working in microsoft and other tech companies to adopt tech but we've had our own journey to the cloud uh and and i mentioned silos are something which we have uh we have broken over the years where where is departments would keep their data and their files and 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 knowledge in their own servers uh, and they were not you know uh, in the in the cloud and i think over the last 10 years we've had a journey to move to the to the cloud and 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 bring that modern tools adoption journey including adopting data analytics uh, uh ai in the way we do compliance analytics or where we look at uh you know policy uh, violations we we look at power bi to visualize data we have a pretty big uh, data science team inside sila uh, and of course uh, then we have teams adoption of teams uh, and i can say very very openly that uh you know we are using less of outlook today which is which may come surprise to many we are using more of teams because teams is not just an av solution is a productivity and a collaboration platform Uh, and how fast from lengthy mails and and very you know jargon uh, you know i think filled languages we are into shorter conversation faster decision making and quick engagements and and joint collaboration uh, and and i i remember the delight i had when four of my team members edited a document live which we were running on a deadline 
as compared to one, one team member working uh, and then sending it in the second team to third and third to fourth, we were all together in one document on Teams and we were able to edit, ask questions, respond, and we were, we were able to cut down our ability to finalize a document by over 60 to 70%, which was completely, I would say, a hard moment for us. And I think that has been a journey that you have to first understand how the tool works. So if you don't know how to use that modern collaboration tool in real time, you will struggle and find it, you know, it's not working for me. But point is, it is all about building that capability. Let me end by saying, I think you can't just simply learn about your own tech. I think what more you need to, when this part of your transformation is, are you learning enough from your customers? Uh, uh, because customers can teach you a lot more about your market and, and where the future holds uh, than just you trying to assess yourself and the governments and partners, right? I think we have this uh, you know, culture, again, another culture piece is customer obsession and customer centricity. Uh, and these two are really driving us to saying, we want to learn it all. Again, you know, we are not on a journey to tell a customer what we can do or what they should do. It's about what we can do and what we can learn about you. And that also uh, brings uh, you know, uh, uh, a kind of a responsibility on the GCs and the teams to say, do we understand the external environment enough? And do we need to develop the industry depth? Do we need to develop more, you know, the government programs and also you know, how partners are evolving? Ultimately, I will finish with the fact that I think we all feel like new employees all the time, right? So I've been in the company for 14 years. Uh, to be honest, every day is, is you feel like, oh my God, this is so much to learn and so much new, new is happening. So I think having a learning and developing roadmap for my team, uh, we do constant trainings. Uh, we have customized training for CELA. Of course, we can't learn every single aspect, but I think it's to choose which trainings you require, which learnings you need to have uh, and have set dedicated time in your calendars because work sometimes just sucks you in so hard every day that you figure out, hey, where do I have time to sit and just read and learn something? I think, I think it's doable. You just have to have a discipline for it. Well, I, I had written down, have a zeal to say, am I learning something today? And I think with that, Keshav, I think you have infused all of us with a great zeal of learning today. I uh, appreciate so much your comments on these three T's and so many more T's, obviously, than just the tra trust, transparency, uh, and trust, transparency, <laughs> and transformation that we spoke about, because you talked about some key ones, technology, uh, teams, both, both, the, both the, the teams that many of us use on a daily basis and the humans that we connect with. So many terrific T's that, again, are just part of this journey. And I think that is my other takeaway, not only having a zeal for learning, but to know and to give ourselves grace because it is a journey and how lucky are we to, to learn and how lucky were we to, to learn from you today, Keshav. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bernadette. Cold link slide up. Thank you. Oh, somebody stand by. Three, two, one, your life, go. Thank you, Bernadette and Keshav conversation was extremely insightful. Thank you. Uh, coming up next is a panel discussion on the topic of rethinking leadership role of general councils in India. We have a power packed panel of innovative legal leaders today with us to talk on this topic. The discussion will explore areas of greatest transformation and challenge facing general councils as they respond to increased complexities around the globe and exposure to additional and complex legal, reputational and commercial risks essential skills, knowledge, and expertise for global modern legal department, being agile to the fast changing regulations, meeting clients' unique and customized needs, and of course, the future of legal work and the resources, tools, and technology necessary to attract, retain, and train diverse legal talent. Uh, let me now introduce our panel. Uh, we have with us today, Ms. Debolina Pratap, Senior Vice President, Legal and Group General Counsel Work Hard, Mr. Keshav Dhakar, Group Head and General Counsel, Corporate External and Legal Affairs, Microsoft India. Mr. Vikash Jain, Group General Counsel, Vedanta. Mr. Vineet Vidj, Group General Counsel, Tech Mahindra. Ms. Rachita Maker, Vice President, Legal, Tata Communications. And the session will be moderated by Ms. Bernadette Bulletin, Vice President and Global, uh, Lead Global Evangelist, ISOTIS. 
Uh, I would also like to quickly mention here, uh, the audience can type in their questions in the question window, uh, which is appearing on the right side of the screen. Uh, Bernadette will be taking the questions towards the end of the session. Uh, so now I'll invite Bernadette to take it from here. Over to you, Bernadette. Audio cut, intro slide activated. Standby panel. Request all the panel to be keep their cameras on throughout the session. Bernadette, on my queue of three, we'll start the panel discussion. Three, two, one, we are live, go. Well, thank you once again. I think we only scratched the surface talking about all of the changes that are affecting corporate legal departments and their leaders. And so that's why I'm so thrilled to be joined by this incredible panel. I think there is just more insight. I think there'll be all of those that have a zeal for learning. There's much to learn from this esteemed panel. So. I'm going to start first with Akash. We talked and when we were preparing for this, I was asking you about where you saw transformation in your work and within your legal department. And what I really appreciated was you first focused on team as an area where you saw transformation. Do you want to share a little bit about what you were seeing in terms of the, the individual um, changes the individual's productivity versus the team productivity and what was driving that transformation. Thanks, Bernadette. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and my esteemed panelists. Today, I intend to speak on the enablers of transformation. Technology is a big agent of change, but people are the biggest enablers of transformation. Let's take an example. Almost everyone would agree that COVID-19, the global pandemic, has been the biggest disruptor of recent times. The lockdown and the consequent work from home environment forced most of us to accelerate adoption of tech in a big way. This tech has been around for a long time and was adopted by many, but the real transformation happened only when a fraternity adopted it en masse leading to the change in the world as we knew it and probably forever. To me, in addition to tech, there are some more catalysts which speed up the process of transformation. Some of them could be developing a thorough and knowledge and understanding of the business and its needs. When I talk about it, most of the businesses, issues and problems cannot be solved by pure lawyers. In fact, it requires techno-commercial savvy lawyers who understand the business dynamics to do so. The sheer effort in developing the teams and getting them to understand the depth of the knowledge and the business needs is important for enabling the transformation. Another element which I strongly believe accelerates and acts as a big catalyst is the development of our financial knowledge and acumen, especially amongst us lawyers. No offense to our fraternity, we lawyers are generally very poor in numbers. However, the lawyers who develop this financial knowledge and acumen, I have in my experience noted that most of them are the stars when it comes to the business environment. Training and nurturing of the teams aimed at developing cohesiveness with one another as well as the business is something which is extremely important. People understand how the environment works. They learn to work as one cohesive team Individual performances are important, but teams important are the most important. Team performances are the most important. Last but not the least, benchmarking and analytics is and its application to decision making is something which we value extremely high. That's something which is creating big agents of change. The sheer fact that Acknowledging the fact that there are people or teams or groups which are better than us and learning from them. 
learn it all is what Keshav said. And I take it from there that learning from what is already there and using that knowledge, analyzing it, being data centric and apply, applying it in our day to day work is something which makes our decision making extremely easy and focused. Thank you. Over to you, Bernard. Thanks, Akash. I, what I love about that, and it goes to something, Keshav, that you said, that your legal department had had uh, data scientists. I would love to think of a legal engineer data scientist that is looking at a process that isn't afraid of numbers. And I do think, uh, to your point, Akash, that that is about training. And it's the one of those skills that maybe as you're looking at your learning roadmap for everyone that's joining us, uh, what your, your 2022 roadmap can include financial acumen, so important for corporate legal teams to have that and to have that comfort and to understand that business. And I do know that that has been more difficult to have that opportunity to have that knowledge training, whether it's about legal topics or uh, the business or financial acumen, but we need to make room to learn so we can go on that, that journey of transformation. Devalina, when you and I were talking, we were talking about, again, some of the technology and tools and similar to many of the panelists, you really focused on those tools for collaboration, not just within your own business and with your own stakeholders, but even how you were working with, with tribunals and other, other lawyers. Can you tell me a little bit about what's been driving that change for you and a little bit more about what that impact of that transformation has been. Uh, thank you, Bernadette, and good morning, everyone. Uh, the, as the uh, cast said, you know, the pandemic uh, and COVID-19 conditions across the globe has, uh, you know, made us not only learn new things, but also unlearn a lot of things which we knew. So uh, we had to start and, you know, being from a healthcare and pharma background, our organization has you know, verticals in various streams of pharma, biotech, new chemical entities and healthcare. Uh, we had to literally, uh, I would say 99% start on a blank slate. So even uh, the legal department, you know, we had to look at the entire atmosphere of doing work, uh, organizing ourselves and engaging ourselves with internal as well as external customers and stakeholders with new thinking and new positive thinking. So, you know, we had to start from scratch as to, you know, how do we do the right thing, but in a different manner in a different platform. And that's where uh, a technology or a digital legal department uh, helped and it was born as far as you know, our organization was concerned. And I must share with you, Bernadette, that you know, we have digital champion in every department in our organization, including the legal department, who runs through the technology process with internal and external customers. Uh, uh, the how we deal uh, with AI and technology with tribunals for faster disposal of matters, how we deal with regulate with regulators, you know, championing uh, the form of technology. It was a slow process, it was a tough process, because, uh, you know, uh, uh, changing a platform or technology in dealing with regulators and government is not very simple and especially you know in jurisdictions uh, which are containing and consisting of developing nations it's not very easy but uh, you know as a fraternity as a legal fraternity I, and i i don't only restrict to healthcare and pharma but uh, the fraternity itself uh, you know they raised the bar and everything went online everything went digital and we could do the right thing, but in a very different and new way. You know, the sun still shone in, it still shone in this, uh, you know, in this legal world, but it had a different sky. And that sky was, you know, the sky of di digitization and of technology. And so healthcare saw a totally different way of looking at things. Healthcare legal saw a very different way of, you know, looking at and disposing things 
uh, of course, you know, we have been speaking, you know, Keshav has been speaking and also Vikas has been speaking and we all have been speaking about uh, various tools for bringing, you know, key responsibilities of stakeholders, the contract management tools, tools with, uh, you know, tribunals, tools with regulators, but most important thing is to maintain the sustainability of this. Mm. And very important, and, you know, this is to all my, you know, co-panelists and everyone in the audience and to you, Bernadette, I think uh, simplicity in the technology is very important. And that's where, you know, we as legal departments, uh, ha along with uh, the IT or the technology division, we try to bring about the best practice processes and try to bring about simplicity in the digitization. And I think that's where, you know, we have made a big progress with our external uh, uh, customers, stakeholders, as well as, you know, with the entire patient community, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, there is a mindset. I'm not talking about, you know, the, uh, the mindset which has, you know, only the digital brains, but mindset, the common man, you know, they want something which is simple and technology should be simple. And all my, you know, technology brethren who has helped us, they have helped us to bring out simplicity in the business process. So, you know, that's where, you know, our great learning and unlearning has been during the pandemic in the digital space. Uh, thank you, Bernadette. Savalina, I so appreciate those two themes. The ones that, that really resonated with me was empowering someone to be a digital champion, whether it's one designate, but how powerful would it be if everyone in the legal department thought of themselves as a digital champion? And I do believe that part of being a digital champion is to make uh, to make that to, to make the tools available simple and easy that it seems to be a theme across in many of the things that uh, many of the panelists have said so um, I really appreciate that. Uh, Vanit, if we could go to you, you too were talking about how technology has been such a great transformation and that you are embracing automation and AI. I, I think you said some sort of intelligence. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about the transformation journey that you and your legal department is on um, and how you're using AI to develop, to develop your team and your practice? Uh, thank you, Bernadette. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to uh, people from wherever you joined. Uh, you know, it's, it's a privilege to be here today and this esteemed uh, panel. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to emphasize on the point that, you know, COVID-19 has been a trigger. It's really done something to us or to the industry, which we, we've been contemplating for, say, last 10 years. Uh, we've done it in six months. It's not just about vaccine creation, uh, but it's also about how the industries have moved. Concepts like work from home, work from anywhere, hybrid. You know, you talk of anything, you know, business to your doorstep. These are unique things that we are hearing and adopted, and that's the future. I don't see it reversing. It's going to further expedite. So, so to my mind, this is the future, and this is where we are moving towards. And to add, you know, having the experience of working with the three biggest IT services companies of India, you know, and as these IT services companies, we've been an important link to the technology owners and to the end users, end users in the healthcare space, BFSI, wherever you talk about. So, so, so I've seen some important journey when it comes to technology, technology adoption, and the necessity of doing that, you know. It's very important, we've been talking of it, we, we talked of, you know, um, things like uh, Lehman Brothers, Satyam, compliance is collapsing, we're thinking about moving, you know, uh, automating, getting the new processes, etc. So, so it's, it's been a journey. And to my mind, uh, you know, uh, technology transformation is the thing that has really happened and that's there to stay. Mm, you know, and, and there is where I think uh, uh, we, we see a lot of focus. Uh, when it comes to me as an organization or me as a general counsel or a legal advisor to the company, uh, my take would be, you know, uh, it's not just adopting technologies, bringing your contracting to say, for example, the contract CLM process or, you know, uh, things like this. But what's very important is, as you rightly mentioned, where is the knowledge? How do we, you know, not only 
put the knowledge together, but then how do we reuse it in the future? So, so you know, all these companies that you know I've worked for, and we've worked in almost hundred jurisdictions with legal entities there. So the great knowledge that we've created in all the organizations, be it on the, in terms of the laws of the lands, be it the compliance requirements and all of that is something that we brought back. We've kind of put that together and see how do we then, you know, use it to the best of the advantages, not just for business transformation, but also for the knowledge development of our legal colleagues and the legal people in the department. I think it's, 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 it's really done a, a sea change and today we resort to technology when it comes to legal department in terms of my mergers and acquisition teams uses, for example, the knowledge is gained to be creating term sheets for my contracting team to use technology, knowledge, the best practices to the best positions acquired over a period of time to how to inculcate into your contracts, to how to you know bring about the best uh, compliance uh, uh, processes and the you know the methodologies globally. So I think we're using technology automation to the fullest. And to my mind, I think this is the future, and this is where we're going to be. And you know, um, and 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 maybe just to add further, technology transformation has to be supported by I would say people transformation. So 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 it's about people who are going to accept it, adopt it, and then practice it. So it's not just about my business, uh, you know, the business teams in general, the project develop, the product development teams, or the implementation teams. It's also about how we law uh, lawyers learn the regulatory, regulatory frameworks, how do we use the technology to the best of our advantage and use it, you know, uh, to safeguard the, uh, the and, and to create the best contracts, best uh, discovery processes, best litigation processes, and so on. So I think uh, I would like to end on that note, but I, I see a lot of uh, potential here. I, uh, nothing that I can further want to add. I mean, uh, yeah. this, we can just go on, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Vineet. And I think you brought up such a great point. This transformation is based on people, the right process and technology, people process and technology. But I think what we're seeing now in this transformation is that that yields data. And that data and that knowledge, one, is being democratized, not just throughout the legal department. It used to be very siloed. But now you're sharing that across teams, which is, to, again, it's a virtuous circle because that knowledge helps train young lawyers. Uh, those young lawyers then train, become more senior and so on and so on. So I think that that is something major that we're seeing right now. And it's something that has been a theme for all of you is not just the technology for efficiency process purposes, but technology to create data, whether it's contracting data so that you understand best, you know, your best practices, your playbooks, your best terms. Um, it might be data about um, uh, predictive data, uh, to give you an idea about um, about litigation or such or penalties and such. So that is that is so incredible. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Rashita, it's your turn now. I know that you are also a fan of people process and technology from your seat. And you are actually embracing low code technology to bring some automation into your teams. So I'm going to, I know I've just used a, a term that many, some lawyers may not know. <laughs> so can you tell me a little bit about what low code technology is um, and what that looks like in your department? Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernadette. And it's, it's been amazing listening to everybody and, and you know, hearing, uh, I, I love the thought of simplifying technology. Um, and and that's really what low code technology is for those who don't who don't know what that is. Um, low code or no code technology, what they call today, is uh, basically tools that you can adopt easily without really having any coding knowledge. Uh, and and that's uh, as simple as I'm not a technical person. I'm a lawyer, so I I cannot explain it in uh, more technical terms. But but the idea is that. Uh, we were able to take technology internally uh, in, in our legal team and we were able to configure workflows, uh, you know, define them and, and make it work for us uh, without needing help of IT. 
um, as much as um, you know, I love I love uh, IT techno IT uh, teams. I think as as legal departments, we tend to suffer a little bit uh, with uh, you know so, sort of a stepchild treatment <laughs> and, and not get that attention that we need. So um, you know, everybody was talking about having. Um, financial um, uh, 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 skills and within the team and data scientist skills within the team. And I completely agree. I think having a cross-functional legal department um, with various skills um, is, is the need of the hour. So, you know, we, we need people who are data scientists. We need people who can understand a little bit of technology and make it work uh, for, for the lawyers. We need people who are process experts and agile experts. Uh, uh, we need people who have other other types of uh, skills within the legal department. So so for us, uh, and you know, everybody's talked about COVID-19 as being a disruptor. Um, thankfully, we started our journey a little before um, COVID-19 uh, hit us. And, 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 and uh, I wouldn't say that it helped us 100%, but it kind of made our during our, our impact of COVID-19 a little, little less within our department because we had started adopting um, certain tools um, that took our manual processes. We looked at it, we, we re redefined it. We said, okay, what do we want our future process to look like? And, and basically the idea was to free our lawyers to focus on more strategic work, right? So we wanted to take on those mundane manual daily processes um, and, and use automated uh, automation workflows to take away that time from our lawyers. And, and our goal in the beginning was, you know, not we, we didn't want to achieve and we didn't want, we, we never said that lawyers are going to be absolutely free, right? We need them, we need their brains. Uh, but if we were able to, even at the beginning, take 20 to 30% of their manual work and, and have automated workflows do that, uh, that was success for us, um, Bernadette. So, uh, you know, we, we, we started with creating small, um, uh, you know, celebrations for us as we reach, uh, reach those goals. But what we realized is using this, we were able to automate, you know, some of our simple NDA processes. Um, who wants to spend time on NDAs, right? But they still need to get done for business to move forward because we nobody is going to move with a pricing code if you don't have an NDA in place. And, and we realized like 75 to 80% of our NDAs did not need uh, uh, a person touch, uh, right? So, so that that was amazing, and and we, we also took some of our really complex pro processes within our regulatory teams, where we have new product introduction, and that goes through a lot of um, interdepartment, uh, you know, uh, uh, discussions, etc., and and a lot of approvals are needed, and so on and so forth. But we were able to even take those processes and 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 run that through an automated workflow. So, so. Uh, and and we've we've over a period of time touched you know pretty much every sub function within our legal department whether it was the contracting function whether it's regulatory whether it's compliance uh, whether um, it is some part of our litigation function and 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 take those processes and convert them um, into automated workflows and I think that that kind of um, you know, helped us uh, deal with COVID nineteen uh, in a certain way because a lot of this was getting done within a system already. Um, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm a great uh, believer that, uh, you know, technology is an amazing tool. Uh, it, it helps us. Uh, but at the end of the day, I agree with what everyone else said, right? It, it's the people who matter the most if the people are not able to use the technology. Uh, so, so the reason why we went to uh, low code or no code was interesting because, you know, when, when I thought about it and I, been in this industry for a while doing this sort of work, I realized why did technology implementations fail, right? A lot of companies invest and have been investing. It's just not in the last 18 months. I think legal tech has been around for a decade or more and, and people have been investing. But, but let's face it, uh, Bernadette, and you probably know this better than I do. A lot of teams do fail in those implementations or adoption of those implementations, and and some of the some of the reasons was because the legal department did not really know how to you know if if there was a change required, then they had to go back to the IT team or they had back had to go back to the vendor to make the change in the process, and and that is something I think we wanted to empower our team. So because our processes are dynamic, we live in a dynamic world those changes had to happen constantly. And, and that's why we decided that we are going to use simplified technology 
um, to, to really um, help us scale up. Uh, what I love about what you've described is that so often we want technology to be a cure all um, and it's not. Um, and um, what I also really appreciate and what I, what I heard you say was that you started to celebrate small wins. And I think that is so important in transformation is that sometimes you say, I want to achieve A through Z. And unless I get to Z, I'm a, it's a failure. Um, and what you forget to do is to celebrate from A to B, uh, learn as you get to, you know, to L, you have to look back and to make sure as you go down that you're really celebrating and learning. And that is part of the transformation. And uh, we have to give ourselves some grace on, do, on doing that. Um, we've talked a lot about how technology has been a transformation. Clearly work from home, the pandemic has all been drivers, driving our team to technology, learning, transforming how we work. I'm a little curious and Keshav, I know you've talked a lot about always learning. Is there a particular skill set that you're trying to develop that is, is different than what was in your toolbox before the pandemic? What's one skill that you're trying to bring to the table and develop right now? Well, that's a, that's a tough one <laughs> because uh, the list is too long actually uh, in terms of what I need to learn and what, what, what should be my journey and that of my team. But I think one area probably if I could just you know, filter from uh, the several that come top of my mind, I think is, is business agility. Um, how do you bring yourself to, you know, uh, learn more about business so you're able to, you know, address and, and cater and, and enable uh, the needs of where the business wants to go. And I think that is a combination of not just relying on your current knowledge that you have and the expertise that you already are aware of, whether it's regulatory or internal policies and, 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 and the practices, but I think is this ability to see what's coming in the next three years, next five years, right? Are you able to anticipate the way AI is gonna be used and consumed in the future? Uh, do you know what data practices will evolve? As you were saying, right, data will be the way in which businesses operate. To me, every business is a digital business, whether you're a hospital or whether you're running a shipping company or your retail or your manufacturing, doesn't matter truly doesn't matter unless you're completely traditional, uh, you know, no tech uh, company, which I think nobody is today, right? Everyone uh, uses. So when you think of every company becoming a digital company in a way running their own, right? And you are a provider of services to, to all sectors, right? You need to understand what are the needs, your needs to have that strategic input into the business agility that's required. Because I will not repeat what everyone has said about pandemic, but we have gone through the demands which, which pandemic had on us, uh, which we probably thought will be a two year or three year journey. The amount of uh, uh, expectations that, uh, that we had from our ecosystem for us to transform faster, to develop better products and more usable tech, uh, right, was very hard. And I think so this area, which is about, you know, you need to be really alive to how the world is changing around you and how you're shaping your department's capabilities to be able to predict or at least have a good, I would say grip on where the business is going and where your, where, where your department wants to transform uh, is important because I think uh, uh, agility is also linked to resiliency. When you, when you kind of uh, encounter situations such as pandemic or, or disasters or, or, or uh, you know, global events, you know, how fast you respond to the circumstances is something, a skill which we are developing at this point, as compared to being, you know, very bureaucratic or, or having a lot of ifs and buts, but how do you take bold <laughs> risks? How do you take, uh, you know, good risks as compared to, it's all about legal interpretation, right? So I think that's the area which we are on a journey. I think a lot to learn uh, to, to be agile. You know what, I think that our, our next conversation should be about the resilient legal department because I do think that that is, uh, that will be a skill because you're right. It, if not the pandemic, there's some sort of challenge and crisis. And if we exercise resiliency, we will be, we will, that is the only way to be prepared. 
Um, Vinit, what about you? What what skill set are you trying to develop personally as a as a legal leader right now outside of technology? Uh, so, Vinit, I think um, it's important. Uh, the GC is wearing multiple hats, uh, and so are the legal counsels. So, to so to my mind. Uh, you believe it, you don't believe it, you designate people or you do not designate people. Today, people, the legal, the lawyers are playing multiple roles, be it the risk advisors, ethics and compliance, uh, say keepers, uh, business advisors, you know, uh, public affairs, policy. I mean, as, as Keshav just mentioned, I mean, he's got multiple teams and so is true for many of the companies today. You know, they see it. I mean, I don't know if you'll believe me, I've even headed labor law compliances, which is purely a, you know, HR on an administration function. So I think that companies are looking at lawyers to really know multiple facets, different areas of laws, and see how do you utilize and do the best and derive the best. So I think from that perspective, having you know uh, done these roles of compliance ethics ombudsman and and so on and so forth i personally see that you know the the legal departments should expand they should look at multiple areas and uh, i've been fortunate to have teams coming from all these facets so to me the people should have cross border knowledge mergers and acquisition knowledge but not just that you know knowledge about intellectual property protections around the world to, you know, ethics to, as I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, data protection, server security, and the newer emerging areas. So that's what we look at into our lawyers, and then eventually, you know, train them, upskill them. And you know what Debelina said, uh, untrain them, then train them. So, so it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's all of that is going around. It's a total transformation. Uh, unlearn, learn, learn new things you know, grab whatever is available, just, just go for it. So I think yeah. so it, it's been about that. And therefore we are looking at lawyers to really emerge. You know, we've been talking about, you know, when we talked about and the panel talked about, you know, going to the boardrooms and so on. So I think we, we, we are doing that. Many have already made it. So to my mind, the legal skill set that we need and which is happening and which is developing, and that's the future to me, is the fact that we have a combination of all these areas. Uh, we learn, we train, and you know, see how do we move forward. And I think we've been encouraging people in our teams to take that courses, to take those certifications, get those exposures, move them into different geographies to get those mm -hmm. international laws you know, knowledge is, I, we, we move, I mean, I move people from one jurisdiction to other. So I think that's a great learning when it comes to the laws of those lands applicable in those countries. So, so that's what I think is the need of the hour. And I think that's what we need to do to our lawyers and to really equip them, equip them to, you know, manage the trends and the, the, the challenges and the opportunities which are going to be available, say, in the next one year, two year, three years time frame. So, so, so that's what we are looking at. We are attracting talent on this basis. We are retaining talents, trying to retain them, uh, you know, see how you, you upskill them. How do you give them the opportunities? How do you help them in their development? So I think it's a combination of multiple things that I just mentioned. So, so over to you. It's, it's the dynamic, the dynamic and the Swiss army tool of lawyers to, <laughs> to be so multifaceted. Well, Debelina, what, as Vanit said, what, what is it that you're unlearning and then relearning for right now as a, as a legal leader? Yeah, yeah, Bernadette. So it's very interesting what we are trying to do in our organization. We are trying to, uh, you know, prepare and uh, implement a very high level uh, process cube or a process technology. And what I mean by this process tube or a process technology is that any segment of work, be it contract management, invoicing, litigation management, trademark tracker, um, a court tracker, uh, data analytics, forensics, everything, you know, we are trying to create a knowledge base with an eagle eye saying that people who are working on this system, on this tube, you know, the knowledge process tube, they should have 
all the things in place, right from the inception till the approval and payment. So in any field. So that is where, you know, we are trying to, uh, you know, upgrade our systems. We do have systems, but they are a little disintegrated. Like, you know, there are individual stakeholders for various tools. But what we are trying to do is bring about a synergized uh, uh, process knowledge uh, tube or a train where uh, people who, you know, they step in and they step out and they step in and they step out, but nobody uh, misses a compartment. And the tool would talk to us in case we are uh, missing any of those components. So that's where we are looking. We are speaking with our internal IT team. We are speaking with our existing vendors. We are also looking for new vendors which will help us to have this uniform globally across all our offices, our factories and everything. So that, you know, tomorrow, you know, everything, whether it's an audit trail or an audit process or, an, you know, a regulatory audit, it's extremely uh, transparent. And, you know, in our industry, we rely very much on a concept called data responsibility and data reliability. And that is what we are trying to achieve as an organization. And obviously, because legal department deals with a lot of data, uh, churning of data and managing data. So we are a very vital part of this and we are in the midst of that process for it. Thank you. What I enjoyed about that is uh, the fact that so many of us are not just part of a regional department. We are part of global departments and global enterprises. And sometimes we think about those silos by, you know, this division or this division. And sometimes those silos are you have to look at them globally to, to ensure that you're tearing them down. So I think that is such a great reminder. Bakash, what about you? What, what new skill are you trying to upskill for your own leadership, for your team? Thanks, Bernadette. For me, it's more about the themes of change and transformation, which are important. I would just try to name a few of them. The startup culture, developing an agile yet solution-oriented, innovation-led startup culture is something which we are working on day in, day out. We are trying to develop more and more leaders through empowerment within the teams. And this empowerment has special emphasis on diversity and youngsters. Mm. There's a culture of institutionalizing the knowledge management with knowledge enhancement for self as well as the team. The larger theme being learning from each other. There's so much of learning around where we can learn from each other. Going back to what I said earlier, the continual involvement in business issues as an integral part of the problem as well as the solution is something which becomes extremely important. Borrowing from what our colleague said, developing a culture of trust as part of our DNA, embedded in empathy expressed in action. That's something which has become the norm of the day. Being rooted in business ethics, compliance and governance as one of the pillars enabling faster adoption and assimilation of technology and digitization, effectively allowing machines to do the repetitive and process-oriented jobs and giving people more time to be creative and innovation-led. And last but not the least, focusing on benchmarking and analytics with data centricity. We have used this approach and partnered with startups to take us from where we are to where we want to be. Prakash, what I appreciated uh, in one of your remarks was the, was the fact that, you know, one of the reasons why we are embracing technology is because as lawyers, we want to, we, we are attracted to those things that are complex and require the strategic legal mind. But unfortunately, because of workloads, we're unable to get to them. Rashida, that was one of the main points I remember that you were saying was that you would love to do all of this work, but there's volumes of work, whether it is high impact works, high strategic work, 
But if you embrace the technology and point that technology to the right pools of work that you are then empowered to do, um, to do those things that are more strategic. And I think that's one of the skills that we should be embracing the, the, the strategic lawyer, but you have to have time to do that. So I'll go Absolutely. to you. <laughs> what about, Sachita, what about your, is there a particular skill that you are going to upskill uh, as we look at this, I guess it's the end of September, we're almost at a new year. So what skill are you looking to, to adopt and to, to cultivate? Absolutely, Bernadette. And, and you know, the, the mantra that I live with is life is learning. So every day has to be something that, you know, what I think Kesha also said is, have you learned something today, right? Um, that, that, is, that is important. And I think, I think when I get to bed, I, I do look back at my day and say, okay, well, what skill did I learn? But I think over a period of time, what I personally want to focus on, and we, we've been hearing in the industry, the T-shaped lawyer and the O-shaped lawyer and all kinds of jargons, right? But what that, does that really mean? I, I really want to be able to um, more and more um, do two things. Is, is One is use uh, my legal knowledge to influence business decisions. Um, I think that is, that is the key because uh, a lot of time, you know, business looks at legal as the no-sayer, right? But that's, that's really not our idea. And, and that uh, the, 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 uh, the, you know, uh, mandate that I give to my team also is, you know, we're never going to say no. We've got to figure out. We, you need to use, we are the experts here, right? And we need to use, we need to use our legal knowledge to be able to grow the business, um, to, to help them churn uh, revenue faster, right? That, that's what we want to do. And I think I, think I want to continue to work on that because um, we, we, don't, uh, we don't work in silos, uh, even though we talk about being in silos, which we do, but we don't really work in silos. We all work together. We have to collaborate. And, and with that also enhancing the value of the legal department. I think for me, um, that is um, one of the biggest things that I want to learn and, and achieve over, over the next uh, few months is, is for people to view legal uh, in, in, in a different uh, way, right, uh, within the organization, not, not as no sayers, not as uh, compliance holders and, and, you know, somebody who, uh, where things get stuck for a long time. So I, I really need, I really want to work on, on changing all of those uh, misconceptions that people have about the legal department. And, and as a leader, what I want to work on is also building more and more T-shaped lawyers. I think that is, that is what is the need of the hour uh, from, from, from the legal leaders, from the GCs. Um, what we need is to have more and more lawyers who are embracing technology, who are embracing data science, who understand that being in a legal function is not about just being a lawyer. That, that's just the base, right? I mean, that's just um, something that's quite expected out of them. Um, but, but you have to be able to understand process. You have to be able to understand technology. You have to be able to read data. That is the most important thing. I mean, we're talking about collecting all this data, but at the end of the day, how are you reading that data? How is data telling us? <coughs> so that is something that I think I want to uh, work on as a leader. Um, I love the notion of a data-driven legal leader. I know we were joking earlier about the the, the legal leader or the GC that shuns math. I often joke that's probably why we all found ourselves in law school perhaps <laughs> was, our, was our disdain of numbers. But at the levels that we are, we have to embrace data and being able to, what we do have are the skills of advocacy and to tell a data-driven story. And that includes telling a data-driven story about your own legal department. And I think that's where uh, benchmarks, being under, to understand what excellence means for your teams and to surpass that. I think that's just really incredible. Rashida, I'm going to ask you a question because I'm not sure everyone knows what the T-shaped, I know what the T-shaped attorney is. I don't even know what the O-shaped attorney is. Can you just share a little quickly about what that concept is? And so, yeah, they're, they're pretty much uh, pretty similar concepts. What they talk about is, you know, a T-shaped lawyer is where you're and I think I got this right. Your T, the the 
horizontal, vertical. <laughs> this is vertical, right? <laughs> vertical <laughs> is your legal domain knowledge, um, which which you kind of work on, and and the horizontal is various other skills that you need to be a good corporate lawyer, right? Which is your negotiation skills, your people skills, your process skills, um, your um, so other other kinds of tech skills. So. There's so many, I think there are some seven or eight and I don't remember all of them, but but the idea is that you're vertically expanding your horizons to various other functional skills and, and, and your business skills and, and, and the, the horizontal, the vertical is the, the, the legal domain knowledge, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so, so as yeah. a lawyer, uh, to be successful in today's business, they say you, you just don't need the domain knowledge, but the whole uh, whole uh, spectrum of uh, different skills. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I think that may be, uh, what, what better way to finish a conversation about the three T's, but then for you, you yourself as a legal leader to become a T-shaped lawyer not just based on your legal prowess and acumen, but having a host of skills that help you drive trust, drive transparency, and will help you drive transfer transformation uh, throughout your legal department. So uh, a great deal of appreciation and thanks to our esteemed panel. I know that, again, we are all leaving with a zeal for learning. Uh, and a great deal of practical knowledge to strive for those excellence. So thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Benedict. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette, for taking us through this important discussion. It was an absolute pleasure to listen to such fantastic panel. Um, I'm confident everyone in the audience has gained valuable insights today. Before we conclude the session, I would like to express my gr gratitude to each of our speakers for making the time to join us here today and sharing their knowledge and expertise with us. Thank you, everyone, once again for joining the session on Legal Transformation, powered by iSurgis in association with Microsoft. We look forward to seeing you all for our webinars and discussions in future. This is Shambhavi Jha signing off. Have a nice day and stay safe.